Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Rick Game Today Com video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with AMD's Navi, which, of course, is the successor to their current Vega GPU architecture. Specifically, comments that the company may actually adopt GDDR6 rather than HBM2. So, we're going to be not only covering the news, but analyzing why they may potentially go that route. And then we're going to finish the video off with AMD Epic. The company are looking to increase the core count epically, ha ha, of their server orientated processors. I'm sorry, that was so bad. To 48 cores, 96 threads, and 128 threads, and 64 cores, which I'm sure you can agree is very impressive. But first things first, Navi. AMD were the first company to really jump on the HBM train, and did so with the Fiji architecture. As a side note, AMD have also gone on record and said that Vega is outselling the Fiji architecture GPUs 10 to 1. Now, the reason behind that is not just because of the sales of the RX Vega series, but also the fact that we've seen, of course, Vega in many custom APU designs, including that of the PlayStation 4 Pro, which is obviously helping sales figures. So that's just a slight bonus piece of news for you. So, the company moving to HBM2 for Vega was not particularly surprising. So, why are they considering adopting GDDR6? Well, AMD themselves have said it's, quote, opportunistic. PC Games N managed to get a couple of quotes from David Wang, who is AMD's new senior VP of engineering for the Radeon Technologies Group. And he said, I think HBM technology is a great technology for data center and workstation types of applications. Also, certain applications require a smaller form factor. Certainly, you pay for it, right? It's low of power. It's smaller form factor. But we're also working very closely on bringing the next generation DDR6 to market. And once a HBM2 is contradicting to performance per dollar and performance per watt, it's just sitting in a different price segment. Scott Herkelman, who is the VP of Radeon Gaming, added, I would say it's opportunistic. It depends on how we see our roadmap how we would like to play it out with some of our partners and the innovations that we want to have and what we want to do in the professional space. But we are fully committed to HBM and we're going to be fully committed to GDDR6 and just let the best solution win. But if you actually analyze what GDDR6 is capable of in terms of capacity, uh, power requirements and bandwidth, you can see that yes, there are compelling arguments to be made to not go the HBM2 route. So let's start things out with pricing. Remember, there are only two companies which produce HBM2, and SK Hinux back in August of last year said that customers are willing to pay two and a half times more for HBM2 memory versus what they paid for HBM1. While it's difficult to get an exact price of how much HBM2 costs, there are a couple of reports online. According to the website Fudzilla, a four gigabyte HBM2 memory stack costs about 80 US dollars. So to put that into some level of context, that means that 160 US dollars of the production costs of Vega go into just two stacks of HBM2 memory. For the Pascal P100 cards, Nvidia used to spend $320 because obviously it had 16 gigabytes total. The cost of the interposer is considerably less. It's supposedly around the 25 to 30 US dollars mark, which means that RX Vega back when it was released was costing about 170 to 180 US dollars just for the memory. So how much does GDDR5, for sake of argument, cost in comparison? Well, you're looking at about seven to nine dollars per module, but do remember that this is old pricing. Supposedly, we were going to see GDDR6 with about a 20% price premium. And also, those prices were for 8GB modules. So, back then, in the midst of last year, you were looking at around $50 to $60 for GDDR5 memory on your graphics card. In other words, it was around a third the price. But whereas GDDR5 just wasn't able to compete in terms of raw performance, GDDR6 is. And this is down for two reasons. The first is that uh, Samsung and other companies are working on producing 16 gigabit modules, which means that each module has two gigabytes of memory. 
and clock speeds are going to be very impressive, running up to 16 Gbps. So what does this actually mean? Well, assuming you're running at 16 Gbps with a bus width of just 256 bit, you're looking at a total memory bandwidth of 512 gigabytes per second, which is very fast, or a wider memory bus of 384 uh, bit width, you can, with the same clock speed, achieve 768 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. And on top of that as well, you're still going to get a rather large amount of memory on board with a 256-bit card, assuming you're using an 8GB module. That means that you can have 8 gigabytes total on your GPU. Or if you're going with the 16GB modules, then you can have up to 16 gigabytes of memory on your graphics card. And of course, the theoretical max of a 384-bit uh, card would be 24 gigabytes of memory. And this, by the way, is assuming it's just operating at 16 Gbps. We've already seen companies who have pushed it much higher than that. Samsung, for example, have produced memory-rich ones at 18, which means that for a 256-bit uh, memory interface, you've got 576 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, or if you're running 384-bit, you've got 864 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. To put that into some level of perspective, uh, NVIDIA's Tesla Volta V100 has a 4096-bit memory interface. That's because it's got four stacks of HBM2. Those run at 1750 MHz. And we have a total memory bus, uh, sorry, bandwidth here of 900 gigabytes per second. And while, yes, HBM2 is still going to consume less energy, it does consume 10% less than GDDR5. Oh, and just in case you missed Amy covering this yesterday, during my coverage of the Computex press conference, I had mentioned that Lisa Su had commented that 7NM was going to be coming to gamers. But new news has arisen, and it's made somewhat doubt whether it's actually Vega or whether she was referring to Navi itself. Unfortunately, we don't have a clarification yet from AMD, so all you can do is just watch this space. But my thoughts on this regarding GDDR6 and Navi is, well, to be honest with you, I'm happy for either solution, and I wouldn't be surprised if it really does come down to AMD offering both, depending on perhaps power uh, constraints, perhaps also space and other uh, situations as well. For example, nano GPUs would probably work rather well. The server market really does embrace HBM2. But for perhaps consumer orientated cards, like for gamers, I can certainly imagine that GDDR6 is going to be probably the way that they're going to be going. During AMD's 2018 Computex press conference, it was obvious much of their focus was on the epic range of processors, as well as HPC and servers as a whole. Of course, when we heard that Threadripper was getting a bump in core count from 16 cores up to 32 cores, by the way, if you want more information on that, you can go ahead and check out the video linked in the video description. It was pretty obvious that AMD were, at the very least, considering increasing the core count for their epic range of processors. And then, towards the end of the press conference, Lisa Su did confirm that they were going to be leapfrogging Zen Plus for Epic. So rather than shifting down to 12NM, they were instead going to move it straight to 7NM, with customers being already delighted at the prospect of being able to simply slip the Epic uh, 7NM processors into their current existing motherboards. That's right, ease of upgrading was certainly something that AMD had in mind, which of course is very important for data servers, sorry, data centers, because they don't necessarily want to change out the entire server rack just to upgrade the CPU. The website Serve the Home managed to grab a leak concerning an epic range of 7NM processors. For a start, there was going to be some substantial changes on DDR4 and interconnect support on the processors, although what that exactly means is still ambiguous ambiguous, but I wouldn't be surprised if this does go into AMD's mantra of Zen 2, which is basically global improvements on the architecture, which we can of course assume means increased core count, we'll get to that in a second, as well as improvements in clock speed and perhaps power reduction, but also we can suspect that chip-wide IPC is going to increase, and perhaps we're also going to see improved bandwidth across the uh, cores as well, which is certainly going to be very beneficial in not just server architectures, but also perhaps for home usage. 
but, and this is perhaps the most crucial thing of all, we're also seeing AMD bump core counts and not just slightly either. From 32 cores for the current line of Epic processors is going up to 48, which of course means 96 threads. But after that, the company are looking to increase it even further, although the timeframes are still ambiguous here, so we're not exactly sure how much of a gap there's going to be. But after the 48 uh, core SKUs, they're then going to bump up to 64 cores, 128 threads. Just for sake of clarity here, this is not a dual socket configuration. Oh no, no. This is a single socket processor, which makes this all the more impressive. It's going to be interesting to see how Intel are going to respond here. I mean, of course, Intel certainly have the R&D resources to do it, but it will take them time to play catch up if they are actually behind. It's not like they can just create something, you know, in three weeks and say, oh, look, there you go. So I'm glad, uh, simply from the perspective, once again, of, well, competition in the marketplace. That's always a good thing from my point of view, and I imagine from yours as well. After all, if AMD are competitive, that means AMD will have to put out, you know, an aggressive roadmap for the next several years, and Intel will, of course, want to actually do the same thing as well, which means that we, even as gamers or content creators or whatever you happen to be, will benefit, and even console gamers, of course, will benefit as well. Perhaps if the next generation of uh, uh, NVIDIA GPUs come out and... Uh, with all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. Normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe, and definitely ring that bell icon. Yes, I have to say that because, you know, the YouTubes and the and its algorithms and all that stuff. But also check out the video description where there is a full analysis of the Threadripper 2000 series that we learned about with Computex, and as well as that, as well as that, you can find a link to a video where we analyze the performance of games with both uh, SMT enabled and disables, as well as experimenting with legacy compatibility mode with Ryzen. With all of that said, take care of yourselves. Bye for now.